It's Friday on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We're joined by Brian Batko today, and we're going to be talking about how a lot of draft experts across the country are starting to see the center position get get ranked down lower and lower as far as the NFL draft process. process. What does that mean for the Steelers' hopes to replace Mason Cole this year, or does it mean they're getting Mason Cole back and maybe even also a Patrick Peterson at corner? That and a lot more here from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette's North Shore Drive podcast. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive Podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive Podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with one of our great Steelers beat writers here at the Post-Gazette, Brian Batko. As always, you can find this show on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this YouTube channel to get all of our Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive Podcast, as well as all the daily content that comes out from all of our sports writers here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And as always, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. Go to Mike's Beer Bar today. There are 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are from the local area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap. They have over 20 televisions. They've just gotten re- uh, some renovations done, and it's an, it's an amazing place to be to take in sporting events, especially with the Buckos back in town and playing some baseball. Check out all our Pirates coverage there as well. But, Brian, let's get into some, some draft talk here because the draft is now, what, 20 days away? So less than we are now less than three weeks away from the, from the first pick of the NFL draft from this from knowing who the Steelers first round pick will be in the, in the NFL draft. And for the longest time, basically since everyone just saw Mason Cole snapping a lot this year, there has been, there have been calls for the Steelers to go get the top center in this class. Some people say it's Jackson Powers Johnson. Some people say it's Zach Frazier. Uh, you know, people excited about Cedric Van Pran out of Georgia, but looking at those players, there's more and more draft experts like those from like Mel Kuyper and, you know, Field Yates and guys that are saying, like, you know, comparing the talent of this center class to the rest of the talent that's on the board, a lot of people are starting to say the center class might not have a pick that is worthy of a first round pick. Is that a problem in your eyes, Brian, or is that something that actually could work out in the Steelers' favor with their other needs? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's sort of a double edged sword there, Chris. I mean, I think it's generally just the, the positional value of center and in recent years in the NFL, it, it doesn't often have a first round pick from the media consensus, at least. And, you know, I guess a couple years ago was was different with Tyler Linderbaum coming out of Iowa and the Ravens took him in the first round. In, in hindsight, certainly, I think a few years ago, Creed Humphrey was very much worth a, a first round pick at center, but he didn't go until the second. So, yeah, I mean, this this could work out for the Steelers in, in terms of just work in your draft board and, and getting one of the top three, if indeed they grade out, uh, you know, the the top three that we usually look at as instant impact guys. You never quite know uh, what's on their big board. They, they could be higher on Cedric Van Pran. They could be lower on Jackson Powers Johnson. You know, we, we may never know. Uh, that's what the scouting department's for. But it, it could work against them if indeed, you know, none of these guys are somebody who, is going to be able to step in right away and, and be an elite center. You don't need that necessarily, but just with how little the Steelers have done to make over that position since releasing Mason Cole right before the start of the new league year, it does seem like they're putting a lot of their baskets in the center draft eggs, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it a little bit of a dicey proposition. Although everything I read and, and see about JPJ just makes me think that he is a guy who can be plug and play at that point. If the Steelers, you know, agree with that assessment, it, I suppose it just comes down to finding the exact right manner of uh, securing him in the draft, whether that's a trade down in the first round, trade up in the second, or just kind of wait and see how the board unfolds. In the, in the past four drafts, or past, excuse me, past six drafts, there has been four of those drafts where a center was taken in the first round. Tyler Linderbaum in 2022, uh, Cesar uh, Ruiz of the Saints uh, in 2020. And he was a guard, too, I think, right, Ruiz? Yeah, that's the other thing about a lot of centers. Yeah. 
Yeah, a lot of centers have that positional flexibility and people, but it's kind of what they get classified as. Well, Linderbaum was a true center. I don't think anybody yes. was expecting him to to play even guard outside of that. So that yeah, was like that 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 there. was that was like one of the few that was not one of the few, but one of the, one of the surefire centers. Garrett Bradbury in 2019, Frank Ragnow, who played very well for the Lions. Um, but look, looking at those options, I, I think that, like you said, like it can be a double edged sword for the Steelers. The fact that hey. There's no like clear cut Marquise Pouncey in this draft. Where like when Pouncey was in the draft process back when they selected him in 2010, it was like, oh, that that guy could be like the best center in football very soon. Like he's an athlete, he's, he's dominant, he's from the SEC. Like a lot of things add big, up there. Six five, he, he, yeah. He was big and athletic. Like he tested well. Like there were a lot of things that worked in, in, in into getting Pouncey in the first round. That everyone was even like, he, oh, if, if you look back, I think the Steelers were initially gonna put him at guard first of all right. they, they weren't even all you know all about starting him off at center but then things happened and, and they needed him there and i'd say it worked out well for all parties i, I absolutely agree and i but the thing is is that there's no there's no guy in this draft process that resembles something like that where that like has the size and the athleticism and the tape uh that that is just like oh yeah definitely you know could be all pro hall of fame category type center and not to say that you can't because like you said you know um you know, you you go back and there's plenty of guys that you'd assume that like like Creed Humphrey. You know, a lot of people said second round pick. Even Steelers fans who wanted him, like you know, it's like, hey, he don't get him in the first round, but the second round, go get him. And they you know, they ended up getting Pat Fryermuth, which you know kind of working a little bit. But certainly, if they had Creed Humphrey, that'd be a big need that would also be filled right r- right now. But all that being said, I, I think it's it's interesting to balance with like, hey, there's no superstar here, but. It could mean that you could that the right value of one of the guys, whether you see it as Van Pran or Zach Frazier, you know, Graham Barton, where does he fall? Does, you know, d- d- does this group of players allow it to just instead of having to trade up in the second round, allow you to go get either a tackler or a corner in the first and then satisfy your need of center of getting a guy for the right value in the second? Yeah. And, and you never know what the Steelers might see in the what we on the outside view as like the second tier or the second group True. of center prospects, they might think there's somebody in there who's not getting talked about enough with the first group of centers. I know uh, right. Lance Zierlein of NFL.com who's well-respected, uh, you know, draft analyst. And his dad was a former NFL line coach for the Steelers, Larry Zierlein. He thinks Hunter Norzad center from Penn state is, mm. is actually right up there with Jackson powers Johnson. I think he's got him ahead of, Zach Frazier and Cedric Van Pran. So that's Whoa. one name. Um, Bo Limmer of Arkansas, not as that's high on. Uh, yeah, not as I was going to say, not as high on Zierlein's board, but as far as just physical attributes, I mean, he was uh, really Im- impressive at the combine with, you know, athletic testing and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, there, there are quote unquote sleepers to us who the Steelers might have a higher opinion on and think, now, if, if we do end up with this guy in the third round, you know, not that we want it to be Kendrick Green part two, but, you know, we think he's going to be able to help right away, even if he's not uh, viewed as a lot of people as, hey, he's he's an instant starter center. We think he's capable of doing it. The, the only thing that makes that risky with, as I alluded to earlier, was just there's really nobody here right now if it doesn't pan out from from the week one on. Nate Herbig would, would be your backup plan, and, and I guess we'll see if they – do ultimately decide to circle back to Mason Cole and vice versa. Well, that's why I want to talk with you in the next segment about because Mason Cole is one of a couple Steelers who have been recently released who are still free agents. And would it make sense to bring them back? We'll talk about that in the next segment here in the North Shore Drive podcast. Chris Carter, Brian, back up. But first, I want to remind you, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar. Again, it's the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. And I don't just say that. I mean it. I go to Mike's Beer Bar. They have over 20 televisions so I can see whatever sporting event I want. If you're there to, to keep a, to keep track with the Buckos while also seeing about, you know, maybe you have some big bets laid down on a, on a hockey game or a, ba- or a basketball game or other baseball games. It's a great place to have all that while enjoying every type of beer that you can imagine. They have over 500 different available beers. Three of those beers are from the local area with all the great craft breweries that are that are in the, around Western Pennsylvania and 
80 of those, those local beers are available on tap, and they're always switching new ones in and out, so that you're always getting new options to come fresh out of all the 80 different taps that they have there. They also have amazing food like their Steak on a Stone, where you get your choice cut of steak brought to you on a heated stone. Every time you cut off a piece, just press it into the stone, and you choose how well done you want every bite of your steak. Only at Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in Pittsburgh. It's on Federal Street, right across the street from PNC Park. Go to Mike's Beer Bar today, and when you get there, tell them Chris sent you. Back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, it's Chris Carter, it's Brian Batko. We're talking about not just the Steelers draft, but their their current needs as far as how they're addressing things. And like you, like you not even lose, you straight to mention, Mason Cole is still a free agent. And the Steelers kind of, you know, let him go earlier in the, you know, before, even before the combine, which we were all kind of like, wow, like, okay, I guess they're just getting rid of him. Maybe they have a plan to get somebody in free agency. Then they didn't get anybody in free agency. And so they are now, like you said, Nate Herbig. If the season were to start today, it would be Nate Herbig or someone asking James Daniels to play center again. Uh, if he was Spencer play. Anderson, maybe last oh, year's uh, 7B pick out of Maryland. Yeah. So that's that situation there. And also another guy that's still available and has even kind of, you know, talked about on his podcast about, you know, th- there being something open to a return. Patrick Peterson, the cornerback that they let go. Um, uh, so I look at that, I look at those two and I wonder, Brian, is this a good thing that these guys are still around or that the Steelers could consider these guys for returns or is, would that just be a sign? Hey, this team really missed in the draft process on some two positions of need. I mean, I think it would depend on what the price point would be if they did come back. That That's what it comes down to for me. It's not that Mason Cole is not an NFL player it's not that Patrick Peterson is not an NFL player even at this stage of his career it's just that neither one made sense to bring back at their salaries I mean they were going into the last years of their deals Steelers typically uh, backload those contracts to to give themselves outs there and yeah I mean neither guy frankly played at a high enough level as starters to warrant coming back at at those uh, prices but you know if Patrick Peterson comes back on a one-year you know two, $3 million deal, then you could probably justify that. You know, Mason Cole, same kind of deal as like a stopgap solution or, you know, emergency option, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I don't know if either one of those guys will necessarily want to swallow their pride and, and do that for a team that just cut them going into the new league year. I think those personal dynamics factor in sometimes as well. But, you know, the one thing that I did kind of notice Thursday, Chris, was Steelers announced, and this might mean nothing. I'm, I'm not speculating as to me having something under my hat that I know, but they issued the New Jersey numbers, and they didn't give out uh, Patrick Peterson's uh, jersey yet. Hmm. All the DBs, uh, hmm. you know, Deshaun Elliott went with 25. Um, Dante Jackson went with 26. So, hmm. uh, you know, that number 20 is, uh, is still available there. Uh, again, maybe that's uh, neither here nor there, but maybe it's kept open in case uh, in case of a reunion. So, um, it, like, and for instance, number eleven, long gone now to Van Jefferson. I I don't think any of us anticipated Allen Robinson coming back for the receiving core at this point. Uh, Presley Harvin's number six quickly shipped away to Patrick Queen. So Mason Rudolph's two goes to Justin Fields, which is a you know kind of a topic in its own right, I think. But huh. yeah, just one of those little. Uh, you know, things that I noticed to number 20, probably a relatively popular number around the NFL, uh, still there for the taking if something works out between the Steelers and Pat P down the road. And specifically with Patrick Peterson, like, you know, we talked about him in the Steelers locker room after, like, when, when Minka Fitzpatrick was injured and Devontae Casey was suspended and Keanu Neal was injured and they just needed bodies. And he wasn't like some elite safety or anything like that, but he was serviceable as an option back there. And he, where he wasn't making interceptions or anything, he was in the right place at the right time and coordinating and having a guy who could show positional flexibility is always of value. And, and, you know, I I think that there's, there's something to there. It's like, Hey, like, you know what, if this team is, could still use like another, a final safety option or doesn't get, you know, the the cornerback it really wants in this draft. And there's going to be some developmental players, 
maybe it would make sense to bring Patrick Peterson back to push. Like say, like like say they they wait until like the middle rounds and they get like Cam Hart out of uh, out of Notre Dame, who, who I think would still be a good pick for this team. Um, but that means that basically your corners would be Joey Porter Jr., Dante Jackson, a Cam Hart slot type of you know middle round cornerback with Corey Trice and Darius Rush. Whereas there's a lot of young hope there that someone develops. There's also the chance that none of them do, and then you're gonna just have a cornerback room of two starters and a bunch of backups that aren't working out whereas if you get a Patrick Peterson it gives you that flexibility like hey at the end of the day if everything else go go you know goes down the drain that guy will at least be a body that knows how to play the cornerback position and give us what we need to kind of just be serviceable there and I think that's where he comes into play and the same thing comes from making goal like look Mason Cole was not good for the Steelers last year, and I don't think he would be really good for the Steelers next year if he's just the starter. And there's that that, that that's the answer there. But let's say the Steelers, you know, we just talked about the devaluing of the center position with the prospects in this year's class. Let's say the Steelers in the first round go get tackle, second round go get corner, third third round with their first third round pick go get wide receiver, and then in the back end of the third round they get a guy like a Hunter Norzad or maybe Cedric Van Prater, somebody there, but they're not a plug and play starter. They're going to take some time to develop. Mason Cole could buy you some time where he's like, hey, he 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 he's been in the NFL. He knows the team. He knows the locker room. He can play well. He can play there for a little bit. Kind of like how Broderick Jones sat behind Chuksakor for last year, and then you know by week eight or ten that this the the center that you drafted looks ready to go. Then you throw him in. But I think both of these guys give you that kind of flexibility, which you know it's not exciting, but it's something that can at least be a backup plan if the draft doesn't go the the, the Steelers' way. Right, and in Cole's case probably be better than Nate Herbig. What gives me that idea? Well, he played ahead of Nate Herbig all last they season. Did, so. They did not put Nate Herbig in last right. year. Right. Yeah, ex- exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see with that. Uh, you know, the other thing, too, is just you, you talk about sometimes some of the best finds at center in the draft are guys who you're projecting from a college position, a different college position to center, which we know it didn't go well for the Steelers with Kendrick Green. But, you know, Graham Barton from Duke, a lot of, uh, you know, high-minded – Offensive line folks out there seem to think that he could make that switch a lot better. And but that might be somebody where he, he might take a little bit of time to uh, to gravitate toward it. So uh, that's that's one issue there. They could still sign somebody for sure. We've got a few weeks to go uh, or you know, slightly less than a few weeks to go until the draft. And, you know, they made a few minor ish moves in April last year to shore up some positions going into it. They actually just made another one last night and Michael Pruitt at, at tight end. So um, so they could still have a couple low-level veterans to bring in. And then with Peterson, Chris, you know, and you, you're kind of getting at this. I mean, he's somebody who at this stage, you know, if he's a future Hall of Famer, he probably wants to win or go to a place where, you know, he's familiar and likes the situation and the opportunity. He could wait around until training camp. I mean, he could just hang out there, do his own thing, work out on his own, And if you're the Steelers or any of the other 31 teams, you do have to have some options in case of unforeseen circumstances. You could have injuries. You could have, um, you know, players who just aren't what you thought they were prior to coming back from injuries. I mean, you could have anything crop up at corner that makes you go back and say, ah, shoot, we do need Pat P back here. And we, and we might actually need him to, to be a contributor on the field. And if, if that happens August 20th, then, at least you know he's been around and it could be a seamless fit for him to step right back in, maybe even to the same jersey number. So he can be patient. He can certainly afford to wait out uh, the draft if he wants, wait out the Steelers if, if that's what he really wants. Or if somebody else swoops in and says, hey, we didn't get the corner we were hoping for uh, as a rookie, Pat P., what do you say? You, you come on down here and uh, and you know maybe we can use you in, in some sort of role despite the Steelers not deeming you worthy of uh, of coming back at that salary. Well, like you did in the last segment, you perfectly teased our next topic for the, for the following segment, and that's the addition of a Michael Pruitt, not just because of Pruitt, but because he's starting to show a trend here of the Steelers going and getting guys who are used to Arthur Smith, their new offensive coordinator. We'll talk about that and a few other things here on the next segment of the North Shore Drive podcast. Chris Carter, Brian Batko, we'll be right back. We're back here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko. Uh, Brian, 
The Steelers added Michael Pruitt, a tight end on a one-year deal. Not anything expensive, just a guy that they've kind of brought it, brought around for depth uh, there. Uh, but it's less about Michael Pruitt that I want to talk to you about and more about how they keep they keep adding guys, lower level guys who have worked with Arthur Smith on the offense. And yeah, they didn't like, go out and get Derrick Henry or <laughs> AJ Brown or uh, Kyle or Ryan Tannehill. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know it, it, any of those guys that were you know names like that. But they've gotten you know Van Jefferson, other guys that have worked with him, Cordell Patterson, guys that are that are that Arthur Smith is used to. And some people are like, wait a second, what's going on here? But I, I look at a lot of these signings. Cordell Patterson is the exception. I think that he his his special teams experience and his flexibility between running back and wide receiver could be interesting. But um, I, I look at a lot of these, these Pruitts, these Van Jeffersons, these other guys, they seem like all like just depth, depth body picks to bring in, get a body into training camp. And if things go, you know, don't, you know, people get hurt, you have somebody that, that this offensive coordinator knows, uh, like for example, Pruitt, you know, people are talking about would he fit, would he take Connor Hayward's job? I'm not sure if he'd take, Rodney Williams job because right. Rodney Williams was a pretty good fourth tight end option we were talking about him all training camp and I just I, I don't I'm not sure if, if that if this is some if, if this is really any sign of what the Steelers are plan, planning I think it's just more so hey they're getting their camp their their 90 man roster ready for uh for the summer yeah I wouldn't get too worked about up about this becoming the Arthur Smith buddy system or anything like that I mean you're you're generally going to have offensive coordinators have some input on players who are available in the free agent market and, you know, guys they've been around. And there, there was a lot of speculation about, you know, I, I jokingly mentioned Derrick Henry and A.J. Brown as people right. who thrived under Smith. But there was a lot of spe speculation about bringing in Ryan Tannehill. Obviously, that didn't happen. Jonu Smith has been with Arthur Smith literally his entire NFL career. He's not coming here uh, as a tight end. I mean, Pruitt's kind of like a poor man's Jonu Smith anyway. And that's sort of how he was used under – uh under Arthur Smith over the years too. So yeah, I mean, I think Pruitt is is here to fight for a roster spot. He's got special teams capability, but I think he's, he's 32. He would be in case of injury, probably uh, get him in there. Or if the Steelers do decide, Hey, we can, we can afford to keep four tight ends. We're going to make Connor Hayward more of like a fullback type guy in, in this system. Then maybe he's the 51st or 52nd guy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the roster. And, you know, Van Jefferson, he's still in his 20s. I mean, he could uh, could very well be a, a third or fourth receiver, and he's, you know, solid uh, insurance going into the draft, I think, even if he's had a relatively unspectacular last couple of seasons. But he's got draft yeah. pedigree from back in the day. Seems like he's a good character locker room guy. And then, yeah, Cordero Patterson, I mean, I think the two-year deal for him versus the one-year deal for the other guys tells you he's – a lot more in the plans for 2024, even independent of his Arthur Smith connection. It seems like they like that kick return specialist ability to him. Perhaps he works his way into some uh, packages on on offense because of his versatility and his skill set. But yeah, I mean these are all pretty uh, you know low lowish uh, lowish on the totem pole type signings. I don't think Arthur Smith is going to be. Uh, you know, running it back with people he he knows and likes and seeking comfort, if you will. I, I still think this is going to be the George Pickens, Pat Fryermuth, Najee Harris, Jalen Warren show for the most part. I, I, I agree very much there. I want to switch it to a mailbag question that you got that you didn't put in your mailbag, but we get to talk about here. Ed Holinsky from New York asks. Yeah, Ed, uh, Ed always gives great questions, but he I had already pretty much written the uh, the the online version of the mailbag before I got this. And I thought it could make for some fun podcast fodder too, before we get out of here. This absolutely could. And he says, asking in a WrestleMania 40, 40 theme, which current Steelers would make good WWE superstars, either as baby faces or heels. And who would you like for this? Now I want to, I want to reframe this a little bit, Brian, because baby faces, I, the Steelers have been a franchise with lots of heel type <laughs> dudes. To, to other teams, certainly, and other fan right. bases, no doubt. But, but, but I think even welcomed villains for this. <laughs> like everyone, no, everyone knew Joy Porter Jr. wasn't nice, but they loved yep. him in Pittsburgh. James Harrison, Steelers fans were scared of James Harrison. Like they, they've had plenty of guys like that. Jack Lambert, you know, you go back Greg to Lloyd. The, Greg Lloyd, exactly. Like <laughs> it's, it's been fun to have that guy that you're like everyone fears him. We kind of do too, but he plays plays for the team that we want to root for on Sundays. So. I mean, but when you look across this roster, 
do the Steelers have like a true like heel that strikes fear into the heart of men? Now, some people might might, might say T.J. Watt because he's really talented, but I feel like T.J. Watt or even a Cam Hayward, they're more like, hey, we just they're really talented dudes that are really good at their job, but they're not like evil people. Yeah, they're they're more I mean, certainly T.J.'s more mild mannered off the field. Cam's always got that chippiness. To he's him. like, hey he guys. Likes- it, well, yeah, I, I meant like on social media sometimes, though, he'll he'll get a little uh, frisky will with people. And then he takes a lot of disrespect <laughs> personally. So he's got some heel tendencies in that way on the field. TJ, I mean, I think he's probably the most hated guy by a lot of opposing fan bases, especially in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Baltimore. Mm-hmm. When you hit guys hard, that's going to be part of it. Some people think he, you know, toes the line, too, at times um, with going too far. Minka Fitzpatrick, too. I mean, and, and, and these these are not coincidences. The better players, the ones who yeah. make impact splash plays, are the ones who other fan bases come to hate and accuse of being dirty and things of that nature. But, yeah, I mean, I think those three guys are sort of upholding the standard of, uh, you know, love to have them on your team. You'd hate to be playing against them. None quite as villainous as Joey Porter Sr., Greg Lloyd, or, or Debo. That uh, – that level of menace in the Steelers defense <laughs> has has sort of subsided over the it's probably subsided across the NFL, not just here. You don't see the Ray Lewis's and Terrell Suggs of the world too much anymore. Or the Vontez Burfix, which is a good thing. That's true. I mean, Vontez Burf, you know, there's there's difference between Suggs and those guys and Vontez. Like Vontez Burfict tried to hurt you after the play. Yeah. Like he and, and he wasn't the same caliber of, of player. He was more known as being a villain right. for actually doing villainous things as opposed to spoiling people with uh you know with big plays or sacks or what have you. No, I I, I agree with that entirely. But I think that there's also when I, when I think back when I think about this team, I think Micah Fitzpatrick might actually be the guy who I think would be a great WWE because like we've also seen like Micah Fitzpatrick has ruined ruined people's like you know ruined teams with with the way that he plays and he's also like mean and nasty like he gets in people's faces like like that there I, there is a an unspoken rivalry between him ju- and just the Bengals like when 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 he when there were so many times he would hit Joe Mixon and he would just get up talking to him and I'm like I don't think people realize that like Minka is like he he I think he is evil to, to to these guys. TJ Watt talks some trash, but like the way that Minka does it, we've also we, we can say this because it's been it's been reported. We've also seen Minka Fitzpatrick throw down in a fight and win pretty handily <laughs> among the Steelers. Uh yeah, I mean, he's dating. as quiet as they get away from the field and in the locker room. <laughs> but yeah, he's got that switch uh that flips in him once he gets on there. I mean, you just talk about in the spirit of Ed's WrestleMania question, which when I mean, we were talking off air, neither one of us watch wrestling now. Yeah, I mean, we're not. We've got, yeah. we've got friends who love it. And I, I did know that WrestleMania is this weekend. Obviously, Ed will be uh, tuning into that. The, the biggest heel turn of any Steeler lately is obviously Kenny Pickett, right? I mean, uh, he still has his own individual fans, which is fine. And I'm not saying that uh, he was completely in, in the wrong with anything he did. But, but going from... Pittsburgh to Philly Steelers to Eagles and even his introductory presser he was dressed in in all black uh talking to the Philly media like that was and he had the long hair the long slick back hair a little bit of facial hair it's like <laughs> this is Kenny Pickett's Steelers I'm not gonna say Pittsburgh because I know he's still beloved by the Pitt community and uh and even some Steelers fans too but this was Kenny's Steelers heel turn that nobody saw coming you talk about the football being the Ultimate mm-hmm. reality show. In this case, call it a professional wrestling work. Uh, nobody anticipated the Kenny Pickett heel turn in uh, in March of 2024. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I certainly think that's a, that's an interesting as far as heel because, like, again, like Kenny Pickett doesn't isn't a guy that strikes you as like he's going to come and beat you up and take your lunch money. Right. But as far as a a person to to, to 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 see as a villain, that that's an interesting take there. I like I like the direction that you took that in because that's uh he's certainly become a heel for the non pit fans segments or sections of the uh, uh of the Pittsburgh Steelers fandom. There, I, I guess the I'll ultimate with- face or hero of the steel of of this current Steelers team would maybe be Russell Wilson. Like he's I feel like that'd he's be. has that you know profile around the NFL wants everybody to like him if not love him people criticize him for being too cheesy and corny at times i guess he would he would fit ed's question there for the uh the ultimate uh, baby face if that's the wrestling term we're going with uh, the i got two players who i think could become major villains or heels 
this upcoming year, George Pickens and Joey Porter Jr. Because I think Joey Porter Jr., he's great with us in the media. Like he's like he's he's been polished in that regard. You know, his dad was around it. He was around it. So like that's natural to him. And I think that we kind of just saw him as a rookie kind of fitting in. But now this year, he he knows he's CB1. He knows he he knows he can he, he he can hang with the big dogs in the NFL. Let him start taking away like have a game where like he limits Jamar Chase the way like Ike Taylor used to limit Chad Ochocinco. Let him have a game where he lines up with a number one receiver and ices him, and then it's talking trash. And he's even said like, "Hey, I'm my dad on the field. You know, I'm mom off the field, but I'm my dad on the field. If he starts doing that and is good at it." He could become one of those villains in the NFL, much like his father was. And George Pickens, I say that because I think George Pickens is kind of a villain to a lot of teams out. Like you go back to the touchdown he had against the Bengals when he pointed backward. I know if I when you post that picture, I I, I have you know I do I do other podcasts and stuff, and I interact with a lot of Bengals guys and stuff. And when you put that, they're like, man, we don't like that guy. <laughs> like there's 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 a lot of stuff that you don't like about this. So I think if there's two guys that could emerge as villains or, or heels in the WWE respective things, Pickens and Porter Jr. could very well become them. Yeah, Joey Jr., very gregarious uh, in interviews and everything, but obviously he does have that dog in him and likes to talk some junk once he's on the field uh, against opponents. And then, yeah, George Pickens, I mean, he's, he's had his own, uh, you know, heel moments with Steelers fans through two years. I mean, there's obviously been more good than <laughs> bad, good but um, you, you hope he doesn't go full heel turn. That would, uh, that would not be good for the black and gold. So obviously he is somebody who likes to get under the skin of, of the DBs covering him. And we've seen the blocks uh, from him, you know, when he's uh, dialed into that part of the game, he, he certainly wants to put people uh, on their behind when he's lining up there and, getting his hands on guys in the run game. So yeah, those are, uh, those are two good picks. I think right there, Chris. Oh, thank you very much. I, I think Friday. that, I think that pretty that, much covers it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was say with, with that, with that, that's thanks, our Ed. Friday episode of the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Not, thank Najee you. Harris. I think he's a big wrestling guy, isn't he? Or I, Cam Hayward definitely has been, I've seen at those WWE events when it's in Pittsburgh. So he, he enjoys wrestling. I don't, yeah. Uh, Najee's another one. I think he could, I think he's a baby face because he's just, for this, for, for for Steelers fans, I think for reporters, he's more of a heel because you know he don't like our questions a lot. <laughs> he could he could snap into any any mode that would be uh, required of him from the WWE storyline. I think absolutely. He's Brian Batko. I'm Chris Carter. This has been the North Shore Drive podcast. We're back Monday after the weekend, talking all things Pittsburgh Steelers here uh, here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Don't forget though, we'll have our our mock draft show that we talk on Saturday as as Brian joins Adam Bittner to talk about that as well. Thanks again for everyone for tuning in. We're on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Back Monday with more here on the North Shore Drive podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.